just um, come back to the actual version 17 of the of the Windows policy, which was at four, I was at 401 of NJ4 bundle, which I cross the phone to my doctor. So we were dealing with normal enforcement cases, that's at the top of internal population 14401. So this is the <coughs> scenario which FB is effectively in, which is a minimum of 72 hours, at least including at least two working days, and then the third case would be at the top bullet point. Uh, sorry, before we get to the heading. Third country cases are where there's a certified claim in a minimum of five working days. And that extension of time the Secretary of State justifies on the basis that that's the first opportunity one would have had to bring a claim. And they, um, she also uses that five working day period before all notice in the chart applied cases, um, where she acknowledges that it's opt in those circumstances where one would normally need injunctive relief. So that's also set out within the policy, just in terms of the, the, the time period, not the... Um, <clears throat> so five working days when it's the first opportunity to challenge. Is yes, or a third country case, or, for, and this is additionally, and we'll come to that in a moment, or it's a charter flight case. So when the Secretary of State put in her respondents notice and we had all the flurry of activity in response to that, and it does get to the primarily to me because the question is, is whether we have notice of removal that's our primary target but tangentially there's a reference to the Secretary of State's justification for, for offering a longer notice period uh, in charter flight cases in addition to the third country and um, certified cases because she says they're operationally more complex but on the, but recognising that most people will need an injunction. So we say, <coughs> if you do need an injunction, and up, up on the current operation of the policy as it currently is, in the normal case, you would need one. So that's why we say that, in practice, 72 hours may be too short. That's not our primary case, that's the court notes. But we just observe that we can't, the, the rationale from the Secretary of State's point of view is hard, hard to discern in respect of charter flight cases. Um, the normal enforcement cases, so unless the exception, of, this is under purpose three bullet points on that page, internal page 14 and page 401. Unless the exception applies, there are three rules for the minimum 30, uh, 72 hours, two working days, the last 24 hours must be a working day, it sets up how the time table works. Then you see at the bottom of the following page, which is 402, the removal window can be extended. Brackets and then over the page again, which is at 403, which is the second headline from heading from the bottom that can be cancelled. And then there's the, the, the there's criteria to be exercised at the bottom of that page consideration of extending the notice period. Um, each case for extending the notice period must be considered on its merits. That's the last line of that page. Individual merits and the key consideration at the top of the next page, which is 404, is whether a person has had a reasonable opportunity to access legal advice and reports in court. Then there's a heading about. So I'm, I'm sorry, I haven't so caught up with you. So this is extending the notice period. Yes, extending the notice period. This is a, a new, <coughs> new provision. New, new after FP initial page. The last line is 403 at the top of 404. So these are all the potential discretionary decisions that might be taken, but they also may be taken, uh, as we've indicated, once the removal window has opened or is in effect. Then over the page at 405, the bottom reference to deferral of removal. This is the this comes back to the injunctive relief point. We'll come to two points in relation to that. It's 
not necessary to defer the ruling on Quentin J.R. Though it's important to satisfy yourself that the person's had the opportunity to lodge a claim with the courts, particularly in third, certified third country, certified in third country cases where there's no statutory in country right of appeal. Well, that's also the claim, the case if they reject the fresh claim representation, because if, if, if a fresh claim is accepted as a fresh claim, then you have a statutory in country right of appeal. So, in a way, it's a similar concept, concept so be it that it's a second claim, not a first claim. But FB is exactly in that situation, uh, which is that he wants a second claim, which ultimately was accepted to be a claim. But had the window operated as intended, he could have now removed it. And so the there's also then the heading over page. Are you going to deal with? Um C consideration of deferral on page 405. Sorry. Oh yes. So the we my the, the junior and uh, tried to access that. And neither he nor the Secretary of State can give further now. Is that right? That's it. My lords, I have sought instructions on that aspect. I haven't received them yet, but as soon as I do, I will. I would to take it for the, for the time being that, that, that those passages, and they're, they're quoted in the skeleton arguments, yeah. but those passages aren't in the in the original document. In the original? A, a, anywhere in any of the versions of this that we have. As far as I'm aware, that's why we that, don't that, have. Just so that yeah, I, I know that's that. Right. Yes. And then as we, sorry, moving over to the page. The Secretary of State has identified cases where a removal window should not be used. And she, that's under, under that first heading. So in answer to my Lord, uh, Lord Justice Corbyn's point of view, about what's the offending nature of the removal window per se, the Secretary of State has identified that for some, in ethic of her own accord, that some people it would be inappropriate to remove such in that way, particularly and she says that they're effectively defined by being vulnerable, so that they otherwise notice would be actual notices required. And again, that from the <coughs> policy and policy statement, which I'll take to a moment. So that's so she has identified some exceptions of her own. Um, and then over the page at page uh, Internal page 21. So that's page 408. Um, she therefore there gives her explanation for why you get a longer period of time if you're a third country or non suspensive appeal. Um, because it may be, although it's not necessarily the case, it may be the first opportunity that someone's had to bring their, their case, their claim, sorry, and that they'll need. So she frames the period of time, the period of notice, directly in the context of getting effective access to the court. Then over the page, so there's about four more pages, and then I'll be able to cut the court into the spot. 409. <coughs> this is where we deal with special arrangements in relation to charter flights. Uh, and the Secretary of State there um, identifies a paragraph, well, perhaps a special, paragraph one, special arrangements to sub, charter flights are subject to special arrangements because of the practicality, complexity, and cost of arranging operations. For this reason, a judicial review application may not defer removal. And then, and then she also refers to other cases, special cases, like in paragraph two. Um, and paragraph three, about four lines down, the person being removed will be notified the arrangement. This is under the non-war arrangement, this is the current policy as it was intended. The person being removed will also be notified these arrangements of these arrangements and that removal will not necessarily be deferred in the event of judicial review as well. Where removal is not deferred, the person will be advised in a letter to be provided by Oscar of the need to obtain an injunction to prevent removal. So in those cases, 
get the notification that you need to get the deduction um, in advance. D does, does that mean that um, if a JR is lodged uh, other than in these uh, special arrangement circumstances, uh, then the removal is deferred? No, my lord, I'll come up. There's a, there's a, the, the next passage is in relation to where, where and when removal will be deferred. So, <clears throat> uh, and then, so she, what she says in this section is that I think paragraph four individuals being removed by special arrangements who wish to legally challenge their removal are normally required to seek injunctive relief as the JR will not result in, usually result in deferral. In such circumstances, the person will be given a minimum of five working days upon removal, so they have to luxuriously take legal advice. The purpose of this extended notice period is to minimise the number of last minute applications for injunctive relief to the court. So these are special arrangements these cases. These are special arrangements. Yeah. This is the charter flight additional <clears throat> time, and currently we're talking, obviously now in the light of the Walker situation, just as Walker injunction, getting actual notice of actual removal plus five working days in a charter flight date. Um, and the next paragraph down, underneath that uh, passage about injunctive relief to court, if individuals, three, like, three paragraphs are rotten, if individuals are being removed by charter flight or special arrangements are not required to seek injunctive relief, a judicial review would usually continue to result in deferral of removal. In these cases, standard 72 hours notice requires rather than five working days. And then you come to the withholding of the information, we don't, which is the part that goes to the respondent effectively about the justification for withholding certain parts of the information at that time. But we don't really need to go to that at the moment. So, in answer to my Lord, Lord Justice Hickenbottom's point, this is the core of where we get to in terms of the access to justice issue. So, this is the, co the context where somebody has made their representations, is either seeking a judicial review. To stop to prevent their removal before they've had a decision, um, and, or it's waiting for a decision that may come in the removal window. So over the page of three, sorry, internal page twenty-seven, which is four one four. Thank you. <clears throat> all the threat of judicial reviews. All JR applications received. To where the removal directions have been set must be referred to Operational Support Centre for Certification, which is OSCU, who will consider on an individual case by case basis whether the referral of removal directions is necessary. Um, so that's for where, so in all cases, just to remind you, the removal directions, will, when removal directions are set, that in this scenario, the Secretary of State has either notified them under the provisions she may give. Or as she knows about them, but the, the applicant and the solicitors and the court do not. So that's just the context of this. Where paragraph three, where there's, a, where there's a threat of judicial review, removal directions must remain in place until a Crown Office reference number or other tribunal injunction, reference or injunction is obtained in accordance with the referral of removal. However, even a complete JR, even a complete JR paper submitted, removal directions can be maintained where certain exceptions apply and the JR can, would not be a barrier to removal. And this is the part I want to, I think this hopefully will deal with the points that my Lord is concerned with, where JR will not suspend removal in state cases. So if we just turn over two pages further, we can get to page 416, internal page 29. This is where judicial review proceedings will automatically uh, will not suspend removal, uh, i.e. automatically suspend removal. And, and it emphasises that this, that this is not in relation to charter flight cases, the special arrangement cases. This section at the top of the page tells you how to determine whether removal should be suspended in situations where removal arrangements are in place, or immigration courts have been made a removal request, and JR proceedings have been made against that. Against that removal. So, qualifying criteria state where JR proceedings are against removal are broad, the removal will normally be suspended. So, that marks the, my Lord's first point. However, in 
certain circumstances, it will not be necessary to state a standard reason. The first consideration is whether one or more of the following qualifying criteria are met. And there's a series of bullet points. <coughs> the one that's material for our purposes is the fourth bullet point. The JR is brought while the person is within the removal window, as long as the person with the remains within the removal window. Unless another qualifying criteria applies, in which case you can still be removed. So, critically, as I think it's just it's the evidential policy based point, just the fourth point I'm making at the outset in the opening. If you are in the window, so once the 72 hours have passed, even if you bring a JR after the 72 hours, it won't be automatically suspended. You'll have to trouble the court to get an injunction. But you may, because you don't know when your removal is going to be, it may be too late. Um, and so that's, in, in summary terms, why we say the policy is uh, unlawful for the reasons that we set out. But that's where the, the inequality <coughs> arises. But this, this um, presupposes that legal proceedings have been commenced. Yes, indeed. I mean, this presupposes that, that, that it's it's further evidence. And if you if even if you do commence legal proceedings after the seventy-two hours, <coughs> you have to then get an injunction, and that would have to be a preemptive injunction. And you won't have the that the ad, you won't necessarily have had the adverse decision in response to the three five three tape request that you make. So it's a further example, perhaps not the complete example, it's a further example. We say of how the you have to be troubled in response to being in a window. You have to go to get injunctive relief, um, even where you haven't had an adverse decision because you don't have, you won't have any notice of such decision. So, for example, in FB's case, he didn't bring a judicial review in the seventy-two hour period. He did ultimately, he, and, and the Secretary of State knew that she wasn't removing him. He didn't know that. He could have been removed. He did instruct solicitors, and ultimately, he sought an injunction. He had to seek injunctive relief from the court to prevent his removal in the window, because the window was open for three months, um, and the only way he could prevent his removal was to, to, because of this part of the policy, was to get to, to try to get an injunctive relief from the court, because because he hadn't brought the judicial review within the notice period. That's and that's a common place would be a commonplace scenario. Or but, but, I mean, but with respect, I mean, so, so what? That's not um, restricting access to the courts. He applied for injunctive relief and he got it. I appreciate that quite a lot went on uh, between uh, when he landed back in the UK and when he got the injunction. I understand that because we've all read the history. But um, as you say, uh, he eventually had to seek injunctive relief. But well, the, the point the, the point we make is that. He had to seek injunctive relief from the court rather than just lodging a judicial review uh, because uh, even though he, I think by that point, had an, uh, an, an adverse decision because he was lodging in the removal window, which is three months long. It's a bit, I, can, I can see that there's a, it's quite difficult to uh, conceptualise, but just kind of... It, but it, 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 well, I don't, maybe I'm not sure it is. I'm not sure it is. <laughs> well, I, well, I think that, sorry, I submit that... <laughs> If the person has a in the, is, has given the seventy-two hour notice period. If they bring a judicial review in that period of time, it's suspended of their removal. But they don't have the decision at that point, or may not have even brought the claim at that point. If the claim or the decision comes after that point, they may or may not, of which they have no notice, they may by happenstance have uh, notice of the of, may be able to bring a judicial review, but they're not entitled to any notice. And not only they're not entitled to notice, they also, because of this policy, have to get an injunction. But, but the first part of that submission, yeah. we're going back to this morning, and we, yeah. we've got that submission. We've done that, thank you. But the second part of the submission is, is what I don't understand is, um, and you said that eventually, actually, had to get injunctive relief, as well as simply issue an, a, a jail. Rather, rather than simply issue a jail. But, but so what? That's what he had to do, and he did it. Well, my lord, that's, but the point that we make is that... He had to get injunctive relief because he was in the removal window, but he only had the actual decision rejecting his fresh submissions for a matter of 
for a short period of time, which came outside of the, the original notice book because of the way the play had to be brought. I mean, that's he made, he had to make he made his play. The Secretary of State didn't determine it for several or any weeks. He made but in the course of that window, he made further submissions. It's right to say he made you know, he himself more, more material, but the actual. He was being required by the notice period, back to the first 72 hours, to, to if he'd done what the Secretary of State intended to prevent his removal, which is to rush about getting an injunction to the solicitors, when, when there wasn't actually a removal contemplated, as far as we can ascertain from the papers, because the Secretary of State didn't set, didn't even identify removal, didn't even respond to the representation of all the claims for weeks. Now, maybe she said she was responding to submissions that were put in later. Is that the reality on the ground is that claimant, claimants are being required on the, the notice period to make emergency efforts if they want to definitely prevent their removal because that's the only time in which lodging a judicial review will, will prevent their removal. When it's not, we say, the appropriate time because they haven't had the appropriate notice of the decision and the underlying decision which is response to their uh, claim. But by that point in time, in their, they have to get an injunction. I mean, if the court finds that that is the appropriate balance between having to get injunction in, those, in that circumstance, ask you, as long as you've had notice of the adverse decision, which is another 72 hours, and that, that may be the, the way the court resolve. But resolve it doesn't seem to me to, that this is an access to justice issue. You've got access to justice. It's, it's one that you find, I, I, I understand yeah. the force of your submission, yeah. you find it inconvenient and troublesome, well, but you have access to the court. So my, my, perhaps the better way to put this is that the set, these are the provisions in, par, in this internal page 28, which is how the Secretary of State expresses the safeguards against abusive or repetitive claims. And they are safeguards within the policy. And so that, that is how she, she puts, this is not to suggest that there are no safeguards. So our point is, if we were given notice of removal, actual removal, we'd be able to react to it. And then there are safeguards, if they were properly defined, to stop abusive or repetitive claims. And the following page, that's uh, 417, deals with when judicial review will always suspend removal. Well, and then the, mer the merits and barriers and test, the yes, yeah, which, same, same, which will yeah. essentially um, divert cases to fresh claims where they should be, because it's yeah. not uncommon for fresh claims wrongly to be launched in judicial review. That's correct, and they've identified that. Yep. And there's one other document having taken you to that part of the policy, which is to take the court to the, the justification. The Secretary states, although the Secretary states served evidence from Ms. Dolby and others, Actually, the evidence comes from the policy equality statement uh, as to why she's adopting this policy with this notice of removal with the policy. And you find that at it's FB supplementary bundle one A32. Why 
I should not be using the bill of duty. That's section 120 of the duty that was uh, amended by the 2014 Act to include that provision. I haven't got it there, though, because the Pay Back Law is a federal bill. As a consequence, the practice, as it's described, of serving copies of removal directions which allow claims to be withheld until removal is imminent would be discontinued when one was removed under the Immigration Act. So the concept here is a suggestion that there's an active withholding rather than there being genuine circumstances where late claims are not abusive claims. There has, there's no recognition of that. Whilst it's, as I say, laudable to encourage early claims, um, there was no active withholding. In fact, if there was a pejorative suggestion or inference in that, in that statement. Uh, then the primary aims of the justification for policy are unchanged, uh, and it's, but it's been revised to include a limit on how long notice of liability to removal can run before a fresh notice must be served. That's the seven, three month window, according to you. And then a requirement that certain groups, vulnerable groups, continue to be notified of the exact time and date of their removal. So the Secretary of State acknowledges there is an impact on certain people, or well, there is an impact on everyone. She justifies it by saying this is it's to, to encourage early claims and prevent uh, late claims. But then says for certain groups of people it is simply not appropriate because of vulnerability. Um, it's, uh, it's unclear precisely why she why those what the vulnerability means in relation to the notice period. But she says families, children, this is three paragraphs long, families, children, and other vulnerable groups will be only given notice of them two or three. These forms of notice predate the introduction of the Immigration Act 2014 and notice of removal, therefore unchanged for these groups. And then she gives her object, then she has the 72 hours and the seven days at the bottom of the page, and under the bullet points, she gives her objectives, which are to simplify operational processes, improve efficiency. Create a removal process which effectively balances the need to enforce immigration law with the need to ensure that human rights issues are raised and properly considered, and then the following operational changes that she's is aiming for. So, and then she has a summary of impact in the box in the second box under the shaded in the shaded section. And the aim of notifying a removal window is to reinforce the ongoing duty and further. So to raise any further claim at the stage where it can be properly considered, rather than when to withhold it till the removal is imminent, a notice period guarantees a period when the removal will have to be sought or challenge be made. So I've addressed the court on how that operates in practice, which is, for example, in the, in the MP scenario, um, and that in fact one doesn't get a decision necessarily in the, in the 72 hour period, so therefore. The policy objective is just not is not made or met, and after which there can be removal without notice. Um, just as a final observation, at the bottom of the page, vulnerable groups. She says the first paragraph: the enforcement of removal process is a, is a reactive process. She says it's neutral in it, it, to this extent. It's neutral in its operation. Three lines down. This doesn't mean it's neutral in its effect on particular groups. The decision making is not about groups to be excluded from the removal window policy, which is about four, the second subheading. She does that in the context of, it is, this is three lines at the bottom of that, but it's considered that the increased uncertainty might have a disproportionate impact, effect on these groups, and they might have additional barriers to accessing legal advice in the community in a situation where it's not clear how imminent their removal is. So there's a, a recognition that some groups have, it has an impact on some groups, but in fact that recognition potentially impacts on all groups. But the Secretary of State has only confined them to that, that narrow cohort. And then she talks at the bottom of this, um, on the bottom of this page about the seven days and the 72 hours, 
a shorter period of time for those who are detained than those who are not detained. So where does this fit into the three grounds of appeal? Well, my lord, this is where we this is where we talk when we were talking. Our grounds of appeal are in relation to the restriction, unjustified restriction on access to justice. The justification. When we're talking, so my lord was when I said that my original submission was that the policy, the, the logical consequence of the policy was to put pressure on the court processes and other processes, which went to rationality. But well, there isn't a rationality challenge in the appeal. But, uh, yes, I think in this. Um, Yes, yes, I appreciate Ms. Kilroy's In this one. case, if we take, if this goes to what is the justification for the interference of access to justice bill, the, the entirety of the justification is set out in summary in, the, in this policy, and that's why we, that, that's the, our target, or what we say the Secretary of State's target, is to just to show why that is necessary uh, and important in light of the criteria that she's identified there, including back to the primary point, which is not getting a decision before the window expires, and therefore the, the point I made or the relation to me. And that is why we say that, um, <coughs> albeit that FME was able to prevent his removal, it, it was happenstance, that is why there was a real risk in his case to not deny that to justice on the policy, certainly as it seems, but even as it stands. And that the Strasbourg authority can recognise that one can still get the remedy to show there was a breach of access to an effective remedy, even where one has, in fact, been able to get a remedy after the fact, sort of by hook or by foot, but it still means it, doesn't, it isn't a ground for denying a relief, it's a character relief for the law. But I think I will, for, those, for the moment, I think that's where I'm going to leave it. Sorry. Oh yes, sorry, my lord. In my lord's uh, response, my lord's query about the link. Oh yes. The it doesn't work. The link doesn't work. But as we understand it, it goes back to the question about considering the extension of the notice period. But, but what what I can't find. To put my question in another way, what I can't find in the policy yes. which we have are the paragraphs which are quoted in the skeleton as appearing in the policy. It's so I see it's four, it should be 403, bottom of NJ core bundle 403. Extension 28 days once only. Mm. Right. Deferral, you defer the whole period. And, and those paragraphs are not the paragraphs that are quoted in the skeleton. So, so it, there is a reference to in the ju in Mr. Ju Mr. Friedman's Mr. Justice Friedman's judgment at paragraph 48. There are. I mean, the yes, reference is there and I'm in the skeleton. I'm struggling to find that reference. I apologise, I Perhaps I. It's still the one that's going to go to um, my learned genius pick up has pointed out that there is another version of the policy, an early one. Um, it's at version 15. It's at FB supplementary bundle A183. And it may be that the hyperlink is there. Okay. So the hyperlink may be, the, the, the hyperlink and, may be there. And the paragraphs. Own oh, paragraphs. Ah, yes. Our paragraphs skeleton are in reference to version 15. Right. So which, that was the version which, which page? 183. A, FB. Supplementary bundle one, page one eight three. Sorry, I realised that. Those, those are the paragraphs. Page one eight three. Yes. No, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Just like this is the Thank you very much indeed, Miss Snipe. Miss Cowboy. Yes. My lords, you know, as you've heard, this case.
case concerns a policy with uh, two key features, and I'm going to highlight a third. Uh, the first key feature is notice of liability to removal, followed by a, a very short period of time where an individual cannot be removed. The second key feature is a long period of time or a window when an individual can be removed without further notice. And the third key feature, which is an aspect that arises particularly in medical justice's case, which you haven't heard so much about this morning, is that that notice is served at various stages of the immigration process. When an individual becomes liable to removal, including when that individual is first encountered and identified as an illegal entrant or overstayer, and or when leave is curtailed. Now, FB has explained the operation of the policy in the context of his case, and its medical justice's claim, which will address the full scope of the policy, highlighting its application right across the immigration estate in those kinds of cases, in Dublin three certification cases. And often, before individuals have raised asylum claims at all, still less become appeals rights exhausted, as the terminology goes. It's medical justice's case that the Windows policy, which is what I'm going to call it throughout my submissions, amounts to a serious infringement of the right of access to justice and a threat to the rule of law, and that it is ultra-virus. Medical justice highlights the following key facts. After the window opens, it is a deliberate consequence of the policy that the individual remains in the jurisdiction for at least some period of time. It is also a deliberate consequence of the policy that the Secretary of State continues to exercise her statutory powers in relation to that individual. She invites representations under Section 120 of the 2002 Act. And as you've heard, she makes decisions on those representations as to whether removal is lawful and on applications for leave to enter. She also makes decisions on the proper application of her policies, all in the window. In addition to that, she exercises her coercive powers under the 1971 Act, powers of detention, and decisions to set removal directions, as well as to use force during detention and to effect removal. Furthermore, since the individual remains in the United Kingdom, the life of that individual in question continues in ways that may be relevant to the lawfulness of the decision to proceed with removal, depending on how long the individual remains in the window and in the jurisdiction, circumstances may change in the country to which the individual is liable to removal or in the individual's life. And that brings me back to the point that the court remarked on this morning. It is therefore inevitable that in the course of the window, the Secretary of State will take a range of decisions and implement a range of acts, the lawfulness of which are in the ordinary way amenable to review in the courts. At common law, there is no doubt that individuals have a right of access to court to challenge those decisions and those acts. That most basic right, guaranteed by our unwritten constitution, has not been excluded by any statute. But under the policy, the right is seriously impaired and it can be denied altogether. 
because individuals are not informed of the date of their removal directions, which is itself a judicially reviewable decision, and they can be served with the decisions which relate to the lawfulness of the removal, as the court uh, is already aware, so close to removal that it's impossible for them to access the court. And that is not an accident. It's the way the policy is designed. And once individuals are in the window, access to court is controlled entirely by the Secretary of State. Since the Secretary of State, but not the individual, knows when the removal will take place, she has complete control over whether to serve a decision with enough time to access the court before removal or not. She also has a discretion as to whether to defer removal to enable access to court. There are criteria in the policy as to how that discretion is to be exercised. But since the decision on deferral may be taken immediately before removal, the Secretary of State's judgment as to the application of those criteria cannot be challenged in court. Now, medical justice submits that this policy indisputably creates a barrier to access to the court. And also that the Secretary of State has no statutory power to create it. There is no explicit or implicit power vested in the Secretary of State to generate, generate this situation where he's, she is permitted to take action in relation to individuals and at the same time deny access to a court to allege that those decisions and actions are unlawful. That is offensive to the most basic principles of the common law. But even if there were such a power, the manner of its exercise in the Windows policy is wholly unjustified. Both the Upper Tribunal and the High Court accepted the Secretary of State's just suggestion that the policy was intended to prevent abusive use of judicial review, citing this court's judgments in SB and in Sutterville. It's important to note at the outset that this court has very little evidence from the Secretary of State at all in this claim, these appeals, and no evidence of the scale of the alleged abusive use of judicial review, which would be required to justify using no-notice removals as the predominant form of removal across the immigration estate, including for people who not only have no asylum or appellant history at all, still less a history of abuse, but are encountered by the Secretary of State for the first time. It's also important to note, my lords, that in relation to abusive claims, claims which could have been brought earlier in relation to previous decisions, or repetitive claims, there are remedies both at common law and in statute to address just these vices. Medical justice submits that the Secretary of State's use of the Windows policy undercuts and supplants the careful statutory scheme created by Parliament in sections 96 and 120 of the 2002 Act and seeks to abrogate to herself and preempt the court's carefully, carefully modulated power to regulate abuse of their own process. As the defendant herself states, and this is in the skeleton argument of the defendant, paragraph 11, core bundle, 73. Section 96 enables the Secretary of State to certify repeat claims so as to bar a further right of appeal. There is no equivalent enabling the Secretary of State to bar a claim for judicial review. Quite, says medical justice. Both the Upper Tribunal and the High Court were wrong to conclude otherwise. As you will have seen from medical justice's uh, skeleton argument, it is its submission that the High Court misunderstood the law on access to justice, the policy itself, and also on the evidence. On the law, the High Court wrongly concluded that access to justice was not an absolute right, 
that it could be balanced. That Anna Frigeva, medical justice number one, and Unison could be distinguished, and that the power to withhold notice of removal directions was inherent in the power to remove. On the policy, critically, the High Court judge, Mr Justice Friedman, appears to have thought judicial review was in practice available to challenge decisions in the window. And we've set out the paragraphs which demonstrate that, that are right throughout the judgment in our skeleton argument at paragraphs 10 to 12. Core bundle, 14 to 15. It's my submission, my lords, that the judge's repeated reliance on this safeguard, which doesn't in fact exist in the window, suggests that he had, had, he, properly had he properly understood the policy and the evidence, he would have allowed the claim. And it's important that the defendants do not dispute this misunderstanding at any stage of their skeleton in this appeal. Now, on the evidence, it's medical justice case that the judge wrongly conflated the evidence of medical justice with <coughs> FBs, misunderstood the function of the case studies, and wrongly expected medical justice to make a statistical case. And for those reasons, we ask you to allow the appeal. Now, I'm going to structure my submissions in the following way, and I, I'm, I'm mindful of the court's uh, with, uh, desire to finish as soon as possible. Um, and I hope that having not as soon as possible, if possible, if possible tomorrow, if possible tomorrow. Um, now you've heard uh, uh, FB set out um, ingredients of the policy, but I'm going to explain how it applies right across the immigration estate. And it is a very compl complex policy, and its application is not explained in a witness statement from the Secretary of State. So it does require me, I'm afraid, to take you to some underlying documents. I'm then going to look at the law on access to justice. I'm going to spend a little time on the appropriate test, but I should say in advance that I agree with Lord, Lord Justice Hickenbottom that the test in this particular case, given the way in which the claim is structured, is far more straightforward than in some of the other uh, systemic unfairness cases, because it's medical justice case that the policy is just unconstitutional on it, in its terms, so that one doesn't really have to get into risk and minimum numbers of cases and so on. I'm then going to look at um, the EU law on effective remedy in the context of Dublin 3 and the procedures directive. Again, effective remedy in the context of the European Convention on, on Human Rights and then uh, sum up on how the judge erred in medical justice's submission, respectful submission. So can I start off with the policy in practice? Um, the policies you've started to look at, you've had, your lordships have been taken to the um, primary document under challenge, which is at tab 17. But there are two other documents that are relevant to understanding how the policy works, um, uh, which are at tab 18, arranging removal, and tab 19, liability to administrative removal. Now, my lords, there is a summary. It's very complicated, and it would take me a very long time to explain it all to you this afternoon. So I'm hoping not, not to do that. But what I do want to do is to show you where there is a summary of how it works in the detailed grounds of claim at pages 361 to 369. you'll see um, that prior to that summary, there is a very brief history of the preceding policy at pages 10, paragraphs 10 on it, so it's 360, the preceding policy. And without um, going through it word for word, the essential point about that preceding policy is that notice was given at the end of the process when removal directions had been set. And as we shall see, because I'm going to take you to some of the underlying material, the purpose of that notice period and the, uh, and the 
the reason why 72 hours was chosen was directly to enable um, uh, judicial reviews to be lodged in court in order to trigger the part of the ju uh, judicial review and injunction, uh, injunctions policy that we've just been looking at, which is um, suspension of judicial review. So what... Suspension of removal. Oh, no, suspension, suspension of removal while the judicial review is pending, yes. So it was to avoid applications for injunctions being having to be made, and it was an agreement that was reached with the High Court. And you can see at paragraphs 12 to 13 of the grounds, the rationale for that, for that period. And in particular, if I could ask you to read the quote at paragraph 12, And so what you can see from those paragraphs is that the whole purpose of the policy was to allow a judicial review to be lodged. That was its goal, challenging the removal directions. current policy is, in my respectful submission, an entirely different beast. Because what it has done, as you've seen from the uh, policy equality statement, is bring forward the notice period to a much earlier stage in the immigration process, where formally notice of liability was given, and then a whole range of steps were taken afterwards. And you can see that at paragraphs uh, 15 onwards. Now, you've, because you've been taken through the JRI, I'm not going to ask you to read those paragraphs of the, of the uh, detailed grounds of claim, but could I ask you to skip to paragraph 22 of the, of the detailed grounds of claim. And that makes reference to paragraph uh, section 10 of the 99 Act, which you've seen. And then at paragraph 23, you see reference to the function of the notice that is given accompanying the window. So I get confused with the acronyms. So LA is yes. the policy, uh, liability to administrative removal, which is at tab 19. That was the one you just showed us, yes. And what I would like to do now is that is, in order to understand exactly how this policy works in, and its interaction with the statutory framework, uh, LAR is the most important document. Um, so it may be worth having a look at that straight away. And I'm going to then take you to some of the underlying guidance, which explains in more detail how it works. So LAR is at tab uh, 19. And the passage that is referred to in the detailed grounds, there, paragraph 23, is at 510. It starts at 510. And there's reference, so it's under the heading, liability to removal notification. What you see under the heading single power of removal, under the second paragraph there, 
Under Section 10, a person who requires but does not have leave to enter in the UK is liable to removal. No removal decision is required, but the person must still be notified of their liability for removal. And then, this is the curtailment point, if a person has leave but is subject to enforcement action for breach of conditions or deception, their leave must be brought to an end to make them removable. And there is a, a, a hyperlink to a section bringing leave to an end. You can see that then at 514. Curtailment or revocation of leave by service of Red 001. And I'm going to show you those forms in a moment. So Red 001, 514. You can see there the scope of this notice. So it is actually used as a mechanism for notifying people that their leave has been curtailed for a range of reasons. And the bullet points are making of false representations, failure to disclose material facts, using deception, uh, revocation of indefinite leave. explanation of the basis on which uh, that can be done. And then on the following page, 515, bringing leave to an end via Red 001, you must include clear evidence and reasoning for your decision and cite the appropriate legal basis for curtailment. And then over the page at 516, using Red notice Notices. Red Notices are used to tell an individual they are liable to removal the country to which they will be removed. The notices also include information on the consequences of being in the UK legally, information about any help that might be available to return home, and a Section 120 notice. I want to say at the outset that the fact that a Section 120 notice is served with a Red 001 is a marked distinction from remo removal directions. Removal directions were served at the end of the process. The 120 notice had been served long before. So this is why it is inevitable that the window that follows the notice period will include or will, will, will include decisions made by the Secretary of State on any, or is envisaged, will include decisions made by the Secretary of State on the 120 notice. Uh, but the, the, the section, section 120 notice requires the individual um, to raise any grounds not yes. previously raised. Um, it, uh, under the previous scheme, um, grounds not previously raised were raised, but without the, the compulsion of having to raise them all in one go. So after the uh, once removal directions had been um, set and notice of them had been served, um, further submissions would often be made, um, setting out further grounds why um, effectively uh, leave should be granted. Well, the position has always been that a Section 120 notice required you to raise the grounds that you want to rely on opposing your removal. Um, the only difference is that under the new version of Section 120, it's an ongoing duty. That's the difference. But the question, that if, if you raise submissions, the, the, the position under Section 96 hasn't changed, and I'll show you Section 96 in a moment when we come to the, to the authorities. But Section 96 is the provision of the statute that matches, that interlinks with Section 120, which allows the Secretary of State to certify any fresh submissions that are made, which should have been raised earlier. So that is how uh, Parliament has envisaged that the Section 120 notice uh, uh, will bite in terms of preventing people from relying on matters they should have raised before. Parliament did not envisage that the Section 120 notice would be used as a basis for depriving people of access to court in relation to those further submissions. And you can see then further references to the Section 120 notice and notice of liability to removal, explanation of that. 
And then um, under the heading removal window notification, the liability for removal sections of Red Odo 1 now have three options. I'm going to show you this, the, the notices, but what's important about them is that the, the window is at 1 and 2. So you tick one of those boxes if you want to use the window. But you can also tick the third box if you don't want to use the window or you can't use the window. And they give an example of when you would use that th the third box. And that links back to the part of the policy you've already seen, which is the people who are excluded from the Windows policy. Now, um, in the authorities bundle, there is a reference to the consequence of the injunction that has been in place since March 2019. And what is happening is not that Red 001s and Red 004s are not being served. We'll have a look at the Red 004. But that the box that is ticked is number three. So in other words, the Red 001 is still performing the function of notifying people of their liability to removal, uh, giving them the Section 120 notice, which triggers the Section 96 consequences. But in addition, people are then being given notice of their removal directions. That's under, as a result of the injunction. And then at pages 520 to 521, there is an explanation of all the types of red notices. And you'll see that there is the, the red 001, which is the process that is intent, the, the notice that's intended to be served at the start when an individual is first encountered. Red 002 is the section 120 notice. Red 003 accompanies the section 120 notice. It's served with the red 001. And the migrant is said, this is in the middle of 521, is intended to, is supposed to respond to the section 120 notice contained in the red 001. So another illustration of the fact that, the, that representations to the Secretary of State are intended to be made at this stage. Then there's red 004, fresh, which is served when a new three-month removal window is being set. Now, as we understand it, although, as I say, there isn't a, a clear statement of how this works from the Secretary of State, but the Red 004 notice is usually used when an individual has come to the end of an appellate process and will then receive a Red 004 notifying them, again, with a Section 120 notice, but also um, of a window. And you then have Red 004 extension. There is the possibility of extending it by 21 days. So in fact, if you, if there is, if you haven't managed to remove somebody within the three-month window, as long as you give them uh, the extension, you can then ex you can then remove them within the following 28 days. And just to complete the point on section 96, you can see at 522, recording service of red notices on CID. The service of red forms must be recorded on CID. This is important because Red 001 places the duty on the migrant to notify the Home Office of any changing circumstance or new reason for wishing to remain in the UK. Reference then to the function of the Red 003. And then the reminder, Red 002, will assist in considering the certification of any subsequent asylum or human rights claim under Section 96, if the matter should have been raised earlier. The training on the policy gives a further insight into how this policy works. A supplementary bundle, one, in a medical justice case, 763, if I could ask your lordships to turn it up.
summary of all the forms. This is the training slides. Forms to be served on the subject. We'll just have a look at some of those forms in the policy. And then the purpose of them served on an entrant to inform them they were considered liable to removal as they are an illegal entrant for an overstay or failed to observe a condition of their stay. That's the following page. Uh, forms to be served on the subject. Now, interestingly, this slide, uh, 764, states a bullet point two. Current instructions are to tick the box which informs the subject you will be given further notice of when you will be removed. Uh, but then explains the opportunity to tell the Home Office of any reasons or grounds to remain in the UK. But I, I just want to highlight at this point the, the decoupling of the notice of liability to removal. That is a clear function of the red notice. It is to notify liability to removal. In other words, it's the point at which the Secretary of State tells someone who has no leave to remain in the UK that they are liable to remove them. Now that is an es essential precursor to a whole range of other exercises of statutory powers. And that is why these red notices continue to be used despite the fact that there is an injunction in place. You can see that from the, the, the interim uh, instruction that I'll show you in due course. So these slides in post state the injunction, so that's why it explains that explains the second bullet point. Oh, yeah. um, so at seven six five, you then also you can see further um, uh, explanation of just how broad the broad, broad the circumstances in which the red over one is used on the tail end of deception. The scenario, you're part of an arrest team at page 766. Now, at 769, I mentioned the red 04. The explanation of when that can be served. You don't need to serve it under the Slide, if the person has received a red 01 notice which has not elapsed, and then at red 04 fresh should be said to where a person has not previously been removable because of a pending appeal, but then becomes appeals rights exhausted. And then at 771 and 772, you see the position in relation to someone who claims asylum for the first time. Forms to be served to the subject at 771. Ill N101, used for those who are liable to detention but not yet liable to removal, e.g. a clandestine claim in asylum. And then over the following page, there is an explanation after the first hole punch of what happens if a subject claims asylum before service of a red 01. They have to be served with the form that we've just seen. They're not served with a red O1 because they're not considered for removal while they're at claim for asylum and any appeals are fully considered. But then at the bottom, if a subject claims asylum after service of the red O1, then you just carry on with the process. You do not withdraw the red O1 or serve the ill M101. further guidance uh, on the use of the uh, red arrow for at 811. But could I also then ask you to look at 807 under the heading, under the slide current notices, again summarising what they're for, uh, explains the function of the red arrow 1. It's to inform the individual that a decision has been made in their case, e.g. curtailment of leave. Inform the individual that they're removable as a person with no leave under Section 2, once the decision that they have no leave has been made. But it then also says underneath that, it also provides an option to remove an, a person within a three-month window 
without the need to serve any further removal notice. Now it's important that I highlight option because one of the questions I think we were, you know, the court was asking this morning is, is this a decision to remove? It isn't a decision to remove. There may have been no decision to remove may have been taken at that point. And indeed, it's not clear that people are, uh, it, the, the numbers of the people who are actually removed within these windows on the first occasion that they're served is not clear. And we asked the Secretary of State for figures on that, and we're told that the uh, records were not kept. But isn't that a, a, a reference to paragraph three of the three paragraphs? On the four, I mean, um, it provides an option to remove a person within the three month window, which is one and paragraphs one and two, two yes, and not three. Well, it does, the, the form as a form does provide that option as a form, yes. It provides an option to remove a person within a three month window, yeah. but by ticking one or two, that gives you the option to remove them, but it yeah. doesn't mean that the removal directions have been set or that a decision has been taken at the point the notice is served. That's the point. Now, my lords, um, the complexity of this policy is one of the issues that has uh, bedeviled its application. And there's reference to that pages 820 to 821 of this bundle, in the early stages of the policy, both of the early stages of the policy in force. And you can see in the middle of the page, 821. Sorry, what is this document? This is an email, an internal email. Internal to the Home Office. Internal to the Home Office. And you'll see under the, at the third paragraph, conversations, there's a, in the second paragraph there is a, a, a summary of the use of the policy in charter flight cases. And then in the third paragraph, conversations over the last few days have demonstrated there's a lack of clarity about what these changes mean in practice. The communication of the changes has unfortunately not always reached where it needs to. should no longer be contained within detention reviews. This is about the amount of effort that is put into withholding information of the removal directions from individuals. So this is not a, an inherent part of the removal power. This is a deliberate decision to deprive people of, these, of this information. And you'll see at three and four uh, what that involves uh, and the instructions that are then given. To, uh, internally to ensure that that occurs. Uh, 823, you'll see under the heading non detained cases, the custodial and detained cases, further guidance on how and when they should be served. And this goes to the point of our removal directions set when these notices are served. The timing of service of the red. Oh, I'm sorry, page 823. 823, so under the heading Service of Removal Directions for Charter Flights Only, for further guidance, non detained cases. Have we got a date for this? How does it fit in with the uh, other ones we've seen? It's not clear how this one fits in with the other documents that we've seen. But if there is a date, um, I will, I will um, make sure that I come back to it. This is the massive disclosure that was served on the claimant in the High Court just oh, before, yes, I see that. Um, before the um, High Court hearing. Um, so this was all available to the judge? This was all available to the judge, but in the very last minute. Yes, and well, he deals of, with that in the judgment. He deals with that in the judgment, yes. And so one of the difficulties with his understanding of the policy was it was, it was pretty difficult for the claimant to get on top of all this material um, in the time available and, and, and as it had knock-on effects. Um, 
the judgment. So what, what, I mean, it's quite important to understand whether this is a qualification of the, of the policy that you're attacking. In other words, whether it's to be read with uh, tab 17. Yes. Whether it precedes it and so has been superseded. I mean, this is well, my understanding just... of this is that this is internal guidance to caseworkers on how to make a decision about when to serve, uh, when to set removal directions and when to serve removal notice windows. So it's post policy? It's post policy. And you can see under the heading non-detained cases, the timing of service of the red notice in non-detained cases should be assessed on a case-by-case -case basis with care taken to minimise the likelihood that the subject will become non-compliant with their reporting restrictions or abscond altogether. And then under custodial or detained cases, an assessment should be made on whether the red notice is served before removal directions are set to encourage litigation to occur at an early stage or wait until after removal directions are set to maximise the removal window length should representations be made at the last minute. So the choice is made about when to do that. And then over the page, at 84, and this is a, this is a point repeated throughout these instructions, um, you'll see that, again, instructions to withhold flight details under the heading removal directions. And then under the heading updating CID with the red arrow 4, the note should make it clear, this is in bold, that details of the removal should not be given to the FNA or the representatives. Now there is a, a, this instruction about withholding these details appears throughout these, uh, this guidance. This, this particular piece of guidance relates to charter flights and foreign national offenders. But there are later bits of the guidance that say the same thing for other um, for, for other um, removees. Uh, again, it's the same instruction. But this is a particular point, so far as charter flights are concerned. This is a, this is a, this is in the context of charter flights, which you can then see it in another context. No, no, I'm, I'm sorry. The, yes. My question was: this is a particular issue. Non-disclosure yes. of flight details is a particular issue for charter flights. Yes, it's a particular issue for charter flights, but the non-disclosure goes far beyond um, the charter flight uh, context. And I think one of the points that the claimant makes is that even, uh, and this is what I said in my summary, even if there were a power to introduce a policy like this, it goes far too wide. Um, it provides for withholding these details of the flight, not just of the flight, but of the date of the removal, and we see we see that's relevant to. Uh, I was I was slightly struggling with this because it refers to seventy two hours when the document we looked at a little while ago um, suggests five days. I know Mr. Mr. Kovats was anxious to. Uh, I hope shed some light. Well, I was, I was hoping if your lordship turns to the disclosure letter, which is behind uh, tab forty one, starts at page seven o four. It explains what all these documents are. And you'll see the first page deals with a section of documents on training materials, and that includes all the slides. Mm -hmm. Then at the top of 706, you've got a new heading, Guidance Instructions. And if you go down to the fourth paragraph, you'll see the explanation of the documents at 823. Return commands, pre planning team acceptance criteria. Oh. <coughs> doesn't, I'm afraid that doesn't <laughs> illuminate much for me, Mr. Kovacs, but it may for others. Oh, I'm told actually it's 2.7. Yes, you're, oh. I'm, I do apologise to Lord it's Justice Eckingbottom, it's a fifth paragraph, it's 2.7. It's, it's the same section, but yeah. yep. different document. 2.7. Yours is quite right. So um, the, the 
policy of withholding and, and the, the clear instructions to withhold details of removal directions continues throughout this guidance. You can see it also at 841. Uh, again, in the context of charter flights, but not necessarily um, foreign national offenders. You see that at 8, so starts at 831. 839 and goes on to 831. And you can then see over the page just rounding up on what um, Miss Nike was saying this morning. 843 under the head of instructions. <coughs> Special arrangements apply to those removed on a charter flight, and then further submissions, where the further submissions do not amount to a protection of human rights claim under paragraph 353 of the immigration laws, and those submissions are refused before the flight, the removal can proceed without a further notice period. My Lord, one of the, um, before I leave this guidance, um, I would just like to highlight at page um, 905, this is an email that was, in, that was sent internally in relation to the, the new change to the guidance which allowed for deferral. There's an email chain. The first part of the email chain is about gathering data about the use of the deferral power. I'm sorry, which page? We're, oh, sorry, it's at 9.05. I do apologise. Yeah, right. Thank you. Again, I need some help with acronym. DNP. DNP. Um, deferral of notice period. Thank you very much. Change to EMP, extension of notice period. Yes, I've got it, sorry. And then, um, but it, over the page at 906 at the bottom, starts an email about training size and the use of deferral. At 907, Adam, I've been discussing with Mark, we both feel the team would benefit from a session on how to handle and identify these referrals as it may be too complex to communicate by email. My Lord, one of the questions um, that was asked of Miss Dolby, you can see at 942 in this bundle, the Law Society questions that your Lordships may have uh, seen reference to in the judgment of Mr Justice Friedman. So 942. The question was at 49. Will a request for an extension of the notice period be considered if the request is made after the notice period expires? No. This is about extending a current notice period where an individual is not removable. Having a defined notice period, albeit one that can be extended, allows us to plan the removal. It's not reasonable to keep allowing for a new notice period. If the individual makes representations after the notice period expires, then they will not be removed until those representations have been decided and they've been notified of the decision. So that's the point again that um, you heard this morning. But it, it, what it means is, if her answer is correct, that no um, decisions can be taken on deferrals if they on requests if they're made after the seventy-two hours or the five working days has already expired. And in practice, it seems sorry, no, no uh, decisions can be made on deferral deferrals. Deferrals. Yes, that's what she will a request for an extension of the notice period be considered if the request is made after the notice this period is This is fine. concerning an extension of the 72-hour period? Yes. Yeah. I, I simply don't understand the submission. I'm, I'm sure it's me. Uh, you say that that means that... Um, if, the seven, if the 72 hours has already expired... Yes. ...and you ask for the notice period to be extended because you haven't had... Well, it can't, it can't be extended, it's gone. It's gone, yes. Well, that's the answer, it's gone. 
once you, if you're out, if you haven't managed to get access to a lawyer in your 72 hours, and the lawyer then comes on board and realises that something needs to be done, then the answer to the question of whether that lawyer can ask the Secretary of State to extend the notice or to provide a new or extend the notice period, provide a new but notice. He can do a lot of other things, but he yes. can't ask you to extend a, a period that's gone. Well, I, I logically I understand that. But what it means is there's a premium on being able to do everything within the 72 hour period, including ask for a deferral. So the protection, the safeguard of notice extending the notice period only applies within the notice period itself. Just to emphasise that point. Isn't that like most extensions? If you apply for an extension during the period, yes, that's like a, a, any area of civil law. If you're, Absolutely. If you're doing it afterwards, you're in a much. What, it's much more difficult because yes. the period's finished. Yes, that's <coughs> right. But obviously, what it means is that it puts a premium on whether the initial period is sufficient. That, yeah, I understand that. Have we got a copy of the red 000, the red 006 form? Handy? Yes, we do. Have a copy. Is that on page nine four four? Yes. Um, there's, there's a, the red 006 appears to be, be explain what um, all those law society questions were, where they were coming from. So. Um, well, the red 006 is at page three five nine. Three five nine. I'm so sorry. There we go. to turn to, to, before we leave this bundle, um, for convenience, the FB bundle, um, at tab 14, I said that I would show you the suspension of enforced removal window. It's A365. the reference to the injunction. So the red notice now the instruction is don't open any windows. You must only use option three in the red O one. And that is the option you will be given further notice of when you will be removed. Below that, third bullet point from the bottom, you must serve notice of RDs by serving an IS 151D or ISE 312. Mm -hmm. And that's the notice period, those notice periods that apply. So turning back to the supplementary bundle one in the medical justice case. statement you've been taken to this morning, or, this, or, or the 
this afternoon by Miss Knight. But I just want to highlight that the deferral figures, now these are also recorded in the judgment, they are at 959 of this bundle. I'm sorry, which, which, which bundle? The Medical Justice Supplementary Bundle 1. The bundle that we were in just before we turned. Please, bundle. Sorry, that page? Page 959. What's striking about these figures is just how few of the deferral requests are granted. You can see in the, in the table there. Now over the page at 961, and this is going to be relevant when we come to look at the evidence on how this policy works for individuals in practice. 961, you see the response to the question about delays in accessing legal advice in detention centres under the DDA scheme, the Direct Detention Duty Advice Scheme. And you can see the, the average length of a wait from request, three days in those, in, in two of them, as Brookhouse, Tinsley House, Harmonsworth, four days, Hollywood, four days. Yarlswood, there isn't such a delay. But it depends on the availability of the funds. Are these um, chronological days or working days? Do we know? Um, I don't. I don't have a, an answer to that question whether they are chronological or working days. But either way, whether they are chronological or working. that each entry says which days of the week Does it? the surgeries are performed. Right. But in any event, in a context of a very short notice period, the consequences are obvious for ability to access legal advice. Well, I, I, I um, think um, for Tinsley House, where the surgery is only open for two days a week, Three days can't mean surgery days, can it? I assume it means calendar. Unless somebody tells me otherwise, I'll assume it's calendar days. Well, my, my, I, mean, what, I simply don't have an answer to that question. What I know is that the... And you'll see this from Ms Navarati's evidence. Is that the majority of people that they have seen been outside the notice period. Yes. Now, could I just, um, turning back to um, that bundle in FBS, you haven't seen the witness statement of Miss Dolby, which is the only witness statement that explains the policy in this case. It's A154 to A162. And this is the statement that was before the upper tribunal.
which is that the to bring the and you've seen some of this from the policy of policy statement. bringing the 72-hour notice period forward to the time when the individual was notified of their liability to removal, in order to allow sufficient time for the Secretary of State to consider any issues raised at an earlier point, rather than waiting until the actual removal directions have been made, and then potentially having to cancel the removal. It was felt that the previous process of allowing 72 hours, starting from the point where an individual was given notice of their removal, led to the submission of late claims which could reasonably have been raised and considered earlier in the process, and that in some cases, and I highlight there some cases, uh, this was being used in an attempt to frustrate or delay removal. The aim was to make clear at the refusal stage that people should not be waiting until the last moment before removal before seeking legal advice and submitting their claims. In addition, notifying the individual of the precise time and date of their removal directions was on occasion leading to disruption on the part of some de detainees or to the information being circulated on social media by action groups seeking to disrupt the removal. And that's the chart of black and white. Um, now there isn't an explanation as to how the policy achieves its goal of encouraging people to make claims earlier. It's not spelled out in terms. Um, but the only reasonable inference in my submission from this is that the encouragement derives from making it difficult or impossible to make claims later by exposing them, individuals, to no notice removals. But that, of course, in the medical justice sub submission, that lies outside the powers of the Secretary of State. It's not the Secretary of State's function to decide that an earlier decision is the only decision that should be challenged when later decisions are made. Well, it, it, it makes it difficult to make claims later, full stop. Yes. And that's the whole point of it. Because you don't know when you're going to be removed. The idea is that you don't know when you're going to be removed. And therefore... The idea is that you, it's not, as I say, it's not spelled out, but the idea must be that in order to avoid being removed without notice, you could make your claim earlier. But as we have seen and will see, well, the consequence of that is that later decisions are taken, which are traditionally reviewed. the individual is unable to charge. So medical justice cases, that is, the, that, that is a legitimate and unlawful method of encouragement. But, but that, if, if it is unlawful, that's why it's unlawful, because it, um, it means that uh, in respect of material decisions, um, yes. access to justice is restricted. Yes, that's, I mean, my Lord, in the end, I point that your Lordship put to my slide this morning is that this is a simple case in the end. I'm showing you the complex structure of the policy and you may feel uh, rather aggrieved about the complexity of it and me taking you to it. Certainly not but aggrieved, but... Uh, <laughs> concerned. Uh, but the, but the, in the end, the, the, it is a simple case because yes. the reason why this challenge um, in my submission is well nigh um, indefensible the Secretary of State is because there is no doubt that decisions are being made in the window which are operative um, and as to whether the removal is lawful or not are challengeable that when challenged when individuals by by chance are able to challenge and they succeed um, and that the Secretary of State's policy deprives people of access to the court and, but that, I mean, and that's I, it that's it that is it that is it and uh, the problem that we, the reason we're here is because the upper tribunal and the high court did not think that that was it. Um, and that's really, that is the, the essence of the appeal. Uh, the high court and the upper tribunal thought that there was a balance that was being struck um, because uh, the earlier decision of liability of notice, uh, li li uh, the liability to removal under the and, and of the window was sufficient to permit people to access the court. Um, and that 
fascinating the High Court's case that there wasn't sufficient evidence that this was intervening with the right of access to justice. And we say there is, but it doesn't matter. It's not an evidence case because the intention of the policy is clear. Now, I'm not going to take you to it, but... Uh, but the, in no. the intention of the policy yes. is not to restrict access to justice. You say that, I think, I think your submission is that that's an inevitable consequence. It's yes. not the intention of the policy. Well, the intention of the, because the policy's got throughout... Um, you, you Exceptions. Yes. Yes. Um, littered with them. So the, the, the intention of the policy, and you may say the policy uh, is hopeless, again, it's optimism, but the intention of the policy is to allow due access to the courts, whatever that means. And you say that... Um, in, in practice, um, access to justice is restricted, and you say, I mean, I know there's a lot of evidence, but you say broadly that all of the evidence points to the fact that you can't do all of this within 72 hours. Yes, well, my, my Lord, I don't accept that it isn't the intention of the policy to interfere with or inhibit the right of access to justice. I don't accept that. You don't. Then, then your, your submission must be that the, um, uh, we, we looked at quite a lot of them with um, uh, Miss Knight a little earlier today, but I didn't count them up, but um, there is reference after reference after reference to applying the policy so as not to deny access to justice. So is it your submission that this is a um, somehow deceptive? No, it's my submission that it's a, a misunderstanding of what access to justice requires. And I think this is where we, in the end, I'm going to come to the case law on what access to justice requires. Because what the Secretary of State's position, and it's a position that the High Court and the Upper Tribunal accepted, is that if you have, broadly speaking, access to justice in relation to your removal, at some stage in a period of time, that is sufficient. Uh, there is a balance that has to be struck. And because you've had it before, because you've had an opportunity before, which the Secretary of State judges that you should have used and haven't properly used, and that's the deferral, the exercise of the deferral discretion, then that is sufficient to protect your overall rights. What the Secretary of State does not accept, and the courts below agreed, is that you need access to justice, that access to justice entitles you to an unfettered unhindered, unrestricted access to the court in relation to decisions and acts that are taken by the Secretary of State. For which you have a cause of action in judicial review or perhaps in civil law. And the question of whether you should have be deprived of that right because of earlier opportunities, perhaps because there has been abuse is a matter for the courts or for Parliament. It's not for the defendant, the potential defendant, to a claim to decide that you don't have access to court because you should have raised something earlier. So I do say that the, the policy, I mean, this goes back to what my Lord was putting to Miss Knight this morning. The po it is inherent in the policy that the, and the, and the defendant makes no bones about this that a decision refusing, that's why I showed you that passage of the guidance, a decision refusing a fresh claim, uh, refusing to recognise submissions as a fresh claim can be notified to an individual and the person can be removed immediately thereafter. I understand that. that but the Secretary of State says that complies with the right of access to justice. That, that's Miss Knight's point. Yes. You, your main point is a different one. I'm sure you adopt that point. Your point, as I understand it, is a different one. And that is... Um, now forget about uh, decisions, yes. um, uh, later decisions. Um, the individual is given um, a, a removal window notice, uh, and, and as I understand your submissions, you simply can't do everything that you need to do yes. if you want to do anything within the 72 hours. That's right. And therefore, in the 73rd hour, you become, I'm going to use the word liable to removal, and that, not in the section uh, 10 sense. Ten uh, sense, but um, uh, just generally, you you can be removed. Yes. You you have you, there's the threat of removal. 
that, that's your point, and that's where all of this evidence has come in as to the difficulties of legal aid, difficulties of, of getting an appointment, the appointment taking 30 minutes, you've got to get the documents and all of this sort of stuff. But all that goes to this just the 72 hours window, the, the 72 hours notice period is simply not enough. Well, the 72 hours notice period is not enough to achieve the functions which have been attributed to it exactly. across uh, for the wide range of decision uh, of, of individuals to which it's applied and the wide, wide range of stages of the process. So yes, my Lord is right. But ultimately, the consequence of that is that things then happen in the window when people are liable to removal. And the fresh claim is one aspect of what happens, but what can also happen is a person claims asylum and under the policy, they are irremovable. But in practice, they are removed, contrary to the policy. But because they're neither they nor their legal representatives know about the date of the removal, they're unable to challenge that on the basis that they shouldn't be removed because they've got an outstanding asylum claim. But there, again, we, we, we <coughs> may have to look at this in more detail, but that, that, that's the policy, as, as I've understood yes. your submission, is is clear enough, and the law is clear enough, that if you've got an extant um, asylum yes. claim, then you can't be removed. It is, but the problem, sorry, my Lord. Yes, and so, um, is it the policy that's the problem, or in the, in the, in the instances that were evidenced um, before um, Mr Justice Friedman? Um, the ap mistakes were made by uh, Home Office officials in the context of um, many thousands of decisions a year, um, and the mistakes were plain contrary to the policy. Yes. So but how, does that, how does that fact lead to an attack on the policy? Because the removal directions are a judicially reviewable decision. And the policy intentionally withholds, and this is why I say the policy is intentionally a breach of the right of access to justice, because the policy intentionally withholds notice of the removal directions, which can be challenged in court. And, it, now, and that, that's where the submission devolves. Your submission, that's what it, that's what, in the end what it, what it comes to. Well, the, the, go through the 72 yes. hours isn't enough or five yes. days for all those who get five days uh, work, work, only working days and working 72 hours um, so that's one point Yes. Um, there's the more general denial of access to justice point which is you can have a decision and be removed pretty well instantly with no opportunity to challenge it that's yes. your second point um, and this point is that um, a failure to uh, give notice of removal directions, and not at this point getting back into the debate that occurred earlier about to whom removal directions are, uh, are, are given, but a failure to give removal directions denies the opportunity to challenge them on grounds which may or may not have been um, uh, advocated, illuminated, advanced during this whole process? Well, they, they may not have been, but in the case of a, someone who has claimed asylum, yes. and, and this would have happened yeah. on numerous occasions in, under the old system, <coughs> caseworker errors do happen. That's yes. one of the things that happens. It happens a lot, perhaps one might say not unfairly, I hope, uh, in the Home Office. These things happen. But oh. if you have a well, under the previous system and, and under the position as it pertains with the injunction, you know that you're, you've been notified of your removal directions. You also know that they haven't been cancelled. So you can access the court to challenge them in circumstances where you've got an outstanding asylum claim and they haven't been cancelled. You are well aware and able to challenge the, dis the removal directions which operate. It's, it, ultimately, it's the removal directions which... Uh, is the operative act, it's the, it's the crunch point in terms of determining people's rights under the ECHR, under the um, Refugee Convention, under Dublin 3. It's at that point that the 
question of whether the United Kingdom is in breach of its obligations, and also at, at um, common law, breach of the right of access to justice or under various policies. It's at that point that the action crystallises. And so withholding the notice of a decision that you could challenge as unlawful is in breach of the right of access to justice. But this is essentially this Nike's point, that, yeah. that you've got to have removal directors. A removal window does not work, full stop. Yes. That is, uh, there is no difference between um, the position of medical justice and FB in relation to what we uh, say is required in order to comply with the right of access to justice. The removal directions are the crystallising moment for the lawfulness of the Secretary of State's actions. And it's that that you need notice of in order to... So on that basis, the 72 hours becomes potentially a bit of a sideshow because your complaint is not knowing when you're going to be removed so you can't challenge it and that factors back into what you the submissions that both of you have made about decisions being taken during the window in respect of which there's then no, you say, no access to justice. So it could be 72 hours or longer. It's not necessarily going to make any difference. Yeah. Yes, well, I, 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 the, the central challenge is to withholding the removal directions. It's the Secretary of State who has justified this withholding of removal directions on the basis that notice has been, as she puts it in her witness statement, in Ms Dolby's witness statement, brought forward to an earlier point. It's the Secretary of State who says, well, if you have 72 hours at that stage, or five working days, or seven calendar days, you are able to access the court. So the claimant's argument, and that is sufficient to safeguard your right of access to justice in relation to what happens afterwards. So in a sense, it's a defence argument, and I do say, and the evidence shows, that that is wholly insufficient to protect the rights of these individuals for a whole range of reasons, including that the, they can't even get access, most people, unless they're previously represented, can't even get access to a lawyer and, uh, in that so that's, that's a different point. Yes. We have to separate out the points. Uh, on, on the point, that on the submission you've made, that you've got to have removal directions. Yes. The, the, the Secretary of State can't get away from it. The, ha having the position, which it's clear from the documents you referred us to, she wanted to get away from, of imposing re removal directions, having very late submissions, good or bad, and uh, the Secretary of State being put really into an impossible position, because um, she either says, well, I just can't deal with these in the available time, the, the plane is leaving in three hours, I can't do it, and therefore I have to cancel the removal directions with all the cost and inconvenience that causes. Uh, or she decides it quickly, and an application is made to the court on the basis she couldn't possibly have decided this properly because we submitted 100 pages three hours ago and she determined that there was nothing in it. Well, how could she have made that decision properly? So that's an impossible position. That's, it's clear from the documents you referred us to, is what she was trying to get away from. And you say that's impossible. But what, why are the removal directions so important? The, the Secretary of State, can, un, under, under Section 10, um, can remove anybody who has not got leave to remain here. Yes. So if the issues as to whether an individual has leave or, or has the right to leave are dealt with, um, why isn't that sufficient? Well, my Lord, because the, the removal directions are, is a, it's a challengeable decision which, as I say, crystallises the question of whether the Secretary of State is acting lawfully in relation to you as to your removal. So that is telling you when. But, there's all, but underlying the and removal that, directions, yes. we, we know this from, from yes. practice. No, there um, are decisions when, that when, are... When yes. removal was challenged, and, and in the documents it says removal is challenged, not removal directions. When a removal is challenged, you have to look at the what's happening underlying that decision. That's right. Uh, and uh, you have to work out whether there's an arguable case that this individual might actually have 
sh should have leave to remain here for whatever reason, for articulation, for whatever reason. So the challenge to the removal directions is really a challenge to underlying things. Decisions, yes. Underlying yeah. decisions. Yes, I accept. So why can't those underlying decisions be challenged in a different way, uh, uh, for example, through this window mechanism, uh, as opposed to the removal directions? L leave aside late developments, which can always happen. Those have to be dealt with. But why can't, as a matter of policy, those underlying decisions, claims and decisions be dealt with uh, as per the policy? Well, my Lord, I am, I, I'm not postulating an alternative um, strategy to the one that adopted by the Secretary of State. I, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not asking for... No, I answer. I'm asking but for this to, policy, to explain why... What's wrong with this one? This Why this policy yes. is, is wrong, leaving aside the other issues, in, in not having removal... Do you say removal directions are mandatory. Yes. So, but why? Well, if if well, in this, under, under this policy, if it's the case... Um, well, I think what my Lord is like asking me is that if there, there are decisions that ultimately, when you challenge a set of removal directions, you are usually challenging decisions that underlie that decision to remove. So, a, a, set, of re, a set of reasons has been produced, or perhaps not produced, perhaps it the Secretary of State hasn't applied her mind to it, as in the case of not having um, made a decision on an asylum claim. And that set, of that set of reasons is the basis on which you challenge your removal directions. You challenge the, the removal directions on the basis you have leave or in, are entitled to leave. Well, you, 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 yes, you, cha you challenge the removal directions on the basis that you are entitled to remain in the UK for a variety of different yes, correct. reasons. Yes. Correct. Um, and, and that the Secretary of State's decision to the contrary, in whatever decision letter it may be, is wrong in law. That's what your challenge would be. Well, could we test this perhaps by getting away from 72 days and five days, yes. um, which, which uh, underpin this policy? Um, suppose, suppose there was a policy that was exactly the same as this, but said um, the, um, the window for removal will open in 28 days' time. So now you've got 28 days to see lawyers, and if you think you're not in the, the, this decision to, uh, a conditional decision, of course, to remove you is, is wrong. In other words, if you have a, you say you have a right to remain in the UK permanently or pro tem, you now have 28 days to tell me all about it and I'll make a decision on it. Now, if, 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 if the argument about removal directions is right, even that would be unlawful. It could be 28 days, it could be a year, it would still be unlawful on your argument. Yes. And is it, I mean, how do you deal with the response, which is that um, it, it might be put, I don't know how Mr. Kovats in the end will put it, that the, the argument is, is really losing sight of the substance, which is um, focusing or should be focusing on whether the individual concerned uh, is being removed when he or she, at least for the moment and maybe permanently, should uh, be entitled as a matter of law to remain in the United Kingdom. So what, what, what just rhetorically I ask, is wrong with a policy that enables all of that to be flushed out at an early stage to avoid, if it be right, administrative problems at the end. Well, my Lord, obviously there are a number of different ways in which this policy um, could have been drafted. And one of the points that we've made in our claim is that it's wholly irrational to choose a period of seven... Uh, of yes, leave that aside. Let's take my 28 days. Yes, so if you had a period, 28 days, whatever it was, that it was long enough to do everything that you needed to do in order to put your claim, and you then had a shorter window, for example, at the end, in which you could say that less was likely to happen. The such I mean, I, when I opened um, the uh, appellant submissions, I pointed out that when somebody remains in the jurisdiction, the United Kingdom, the Secretary of State is exercising her statutory powers in relation to that person 
And so the longer that that goes on, the more things the Secretary of State is doing that are potentially challengeable. Um, and that's an important feature of, 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 a, of a window. So the, uh, I don't... Uh, uh, Sorry, but you didn't finish the sentence. Yes. The sentence you started was, if the period is long enough to do everything that you have yes. to do, uh, and the window sh uh, and the uh, window short enough, but you didn't finish that sentence. Then I can see, but I, I don't because I don't no, want to. Sorry, I, can I can see that there may be an argument that in those circumstances right. it would not be necessary to have a uh, to be able to challenge the actual directions. But that would depend, and this is an important but, and an important caveat, on whether decisions were taken or acts taken nearer to the removal directions or in the window that affected the lawfulness of those removal directions. And the problem with withholding notice of the removal directions is that unless you can be sure that there is nothing that has happened since the last consideration which renders the, that removal unlawful, there is a significant risk to access to justice. So and that that's is if why the window is too long? If the window is too long, I mean, if the window, for example, is a few hours or a, few, a couple of days, then very little is likely to happen. But it might. But it could do. So, what, what this, so whatever, whatever time limit you put in on all of these things, there has, to be a, uh, there has to be a backstop. Because even if the window is three hours, something could happen. It's, it's unlikely that something could happen in a particular case in those three hours. Yes. So I, I don't see conceptually what the difference is. You say that the... That, 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 well, my, 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 can I just point out that in the, um, j just, just to be absolutely clear about what the position in the policy is, um, and then I want to show you a couple of, of decisions, what's actually happened in practice, just so that you can see. Um, but the policy, tab 17 of the core bundle, And what you'll see under the heading event type sub subject to judicial review is a list of types of things that can be challenged by judicial review, and one of them is the setting of removal directions. My Lords, until it is possible to say that the setting of removal directions is not a decision that can be challenged by judicial review, my submission is that individuals must have access to court in relation to it. Now, if you can devise a scheme under which the window is structured or, or whatever it is in such a way that you don't need access to court to challenge removal directions, then I can see that there might be something in it. But that is not... It's not easy to think of what that would be. And I must also, you know, I, I, the other thing I want to point out is that in relation to what is the, the vice that this policy is aimed at, and as I've said, there is no evidence before you of abuse, the scale of it. I've showed you how wide this policy goes in terms of its application right across the immigration estate. There's no evidence of the scale of abuse, uh, the, the last minute types of applications that uh, your Lordship mentioned. There's no, no evidence of the quantities, 
um, and when that happens. Or even that this was particularly working, because one of the things that, that um, we've seen is that it doesn't stop people. People can still make their representations and decisions are still being served very close to removal direct to the service of removal directions. It's not as if this policy is avoiding that. What the policy is avoiding is people knowing uh, or being able, having enough time to get into court to challenge their removal directions. They don't know about them. That's what it's avoiding. But remembering as well that what the, the vice is making a claim and my Lord said the courts are given no choice but to grant injunctions. But in my submission, the, the, what is really at the heart of this policy is the desire to avoid the courts issuing injunctions. Because the lodging of a claim by an individual, a judicial review claim, to, to challenge directions is not itself necessarily suspensive of removal. It's the court that will decide whether or not to grant a remedy that is sought by an individual, not the lodging of the claim itself. And so it's perfectly possible for a policy to provide, as the, and we've seen the part of the policy which deals with the suspension of uh, removal on receipt of a judicial review, to provide that if people have had previous opportunities, to make representations that judicial review will not suspend removal. And then the choice lies with the court as to whether to grant an injunction or not. And in my submission, that is the only lawful way to respect the right of access to justice. And it's for the courts to decide whether there are methods of properly um, addressing the kind of scenario that my Lord put to me. Of uh, submissions being made so late in a volum voluminous quantity. So you said that in those circumstances only the court can decide that? Well, my Lord, that is, the, that is the common law, is that the, if the, the court is being asked to grant a remedy, which is, there's a set of removal directions, the remedy that is sought is to injunct the Secretary of State, prohibit the Secretary of State from removing somebody, and it's the court's decision as to whether to grant that remedy or not. Does, does that mean whatever has happened before, even if something's happened only hours before, uh, if substantial submissions, of, substantial representations have put into the Secretary of State um, close to the um, uh, time of, of removal, um, that effectively means that removal cannot go ahead, because the Secretary of State will not have time properly to consider them, and the court will not have time to consider them. Well, no, my lord, that is the situation that was dealt with in SB. Yes. In SB, what the court said is that if you are you have a set of removal directions and you yourself put the Secretary of State in an impossible position where they can't, she can't reasonably be expected to respond to them in time, you cannot expect that to result in the suspension by the court of the removal directions. I accept that. But this, is this policy is depriving the court of the opportunity of making that judgment. And that is what I say is objectionable at common law. I, we are, are, on the medical justice side, not arguing for rep repetitive in any sense, and that's an allegation that's been made by the Secretary of State. It's just not true that the court should not have the power to, to decide not to but suspend. But you say the court has that power. So yes. um, the, 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 the representations will be made to the Secretary of State who will either come to some decision, um, some negative decision, um, presumably not having read anything because it's so long, insufficient time or simply not not deciding it and then the matter comes to the court so yes. the court has to decide then um, I mean possibly very very close to the time of departure yes and um, you know we've all had cases where the individual has been on the plane yes and, this, and how to de de determine these um, issues but it's the court then that has to determine that yes in every case my, my lord yes that is the position now it's the position until this policy was introduced, is that the court, and it, and it is still the position by happenstance. So we've already talked about the possibility that individuals will be, will be, will be able to access the court by happenstance, asking for injunctions. Um, my Lord, I don't shy away from the submission 
that in a, in a case where the issue is, do you have a valid claim which entitles you to remain in the United Kingdom or to challenge a decision of the Secretary of State that your removal would be lawful, that it's the court and not the Secretary of State that should decide whether you're entitled to proceed with that claim. That, in my submission, is what the common law requires. And my Lord, when we look at the case law, and I hope to be able to give you some references, at least perhaps uh, to look at overnight, um, you can, it's crystal clear that um, the, the, the right of access to court should be unimpeded and that it is the court alone that can decide uh, that people should be prevented from seeking its, uh, its powers and its, its, its remedies. Whatever has gone before. Yes, say. whatever. Well, Parliament has already provided in Section 96 for a power to certify appeals based on what has gone before. That, was, that is the balance that Parliament has struck. And I do say, what I say is that the Secretary of State, who is the potential defendant in a case, is not empowered to make the decision as to whether he should or she should be vexed by a claim. I mean, that, is the, that must be, in my respectful submission, the most basic um, I'm sure fundamental... I, 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 I doubt Mr Kovacs would disagree with it if couched in those terms, but um, we'll hear how he deals with it uh, tomorrow. But by all means, give us um, yes. just, just, just a couple of references or more than a couple, if you wish, and we'll do our level best to um, be on top of by the morning. Well, my Lord, um, what, what I would like to do, and I, I was hoping to take you to some examples of, of where problems this is going, which, problems yes, which have yes. arisen. And, um, but I was wondering whether, rather than do that, what I should give you is some case or references to look at overnight and take you to the examples in the morning. I think that would be, uh, that would be better. So, um, can I ask you then to look, please, uh, uh, on the law on access to justice. <clears throat> uh, first at Bramathorpe, tab 35, 977 D to G. Yes. At uh, tab 95. Which one is that? It's Blackstone. Page, it's the very last page of that tab. It's in fact almost the very last page of the bundle, although I think an insert has come in. Page 141. Blackstone Commentaries, book one. Yes. The Unison, and in particular, tab, uh, which is at tab, 40, uh, tab 24, paragraph 74 to 75. Unison is in volume one, I should say. Okay, you've given us three references, and by my maths, they're three different volumes of the four volumes. Yes, they are. Tab 35 is two. Yeah. And Blackstone, Blackstone is in is three. Blackstone is tab four. Oh, uh, volume, volume four. Uh, Unison is, is volume one. I, I apologise, and it may Don't be worry. the best ones to look at are in the core bundle that you may rather than the four things. Yeah. But volume two, Chester and Bateman. Tap 34. 34, yep. Paragraphs, 80, uh, pages 83, 833, 834, 835. Yes. The same volume, City of London and Wood, tap 33. At 1602. Chiari, yes. which is in volume 1, tab 23, paragraphs 56 and 102. I'm going to give you just three more. Uh, volume 2, Rain and Honey, tab 36. 10D to E. 10A to B. 12G to H. 
So we use a um, 13A to C. Second last one, Anderson, which is at tab 37. Yes. 790E to H. This is also volume 2. 791A to D. Some of that is the argument, but it's important to see what was rejected. 792G to H. 793C to E. And 793E to 794B. And then the final, I hope that's not too quick. And then no, well, I'm, I'm keeping up for the moment. I think my and the final authority, Wigan, at the tab 15. Yes. Um, and I'll that's one, isn't it? But yeah. I think you'll probably know where to look. I don't doubt. But thank you very much indeed for giving us those references. We'll look at them overnight and um, we look forward to continuing at 10.30 tomorrow.